Welcome back everyone to our monthly stroke support group. Uh, we have a great speaker today, Ralph Preston. He's back for part two. He's going to go into a discussion again about moving and uh, how we can, as a stroke survivor, be a more positive focused on your own rehab. Right? Right, Ralph? Mm -hmm. Is that you? Take it away. Okay. Well, last time we talked a little bit about what was entitled um, what happened and what to do about it. Um, and so this time, one of the first things you want to do about it um, is to get moving on whatever um, level that you want. You can flip the slide, so, Samantha. Um, and here's the standard uh, uh, left this in from last time. And it's true in this case, too. Last time, you might have to take somebody with you to doctor's appointments or whatever. Uh, there are people in your life, if you had a stroke, that hopefully care about you and might want to get involved in your recovery. Some of the things that we're going to talk about today involve um, getting some assistance from somebody if you have somebody to help you. So go ahead and flip it. And one of the things is... Um, it's really not a simple thing to recover from a stroke. Um, and because all strokes are different, all recoveries are different too. Yeah, I know you don't really want to hear this, but just like you got to become your own patient advocate, you got to figure out like what kind of stroke you had, how that affects your deficits, what to do about those deficits, how to pick a therapy place, how to find a good therapist, how to learn all you can about stroke and PT so that you can uh, carry on when your insurance runs out. Notice I said when, not if your insurance runs out. So anybody who really wants to get better in the long term is going to have to, like they have to be their own best patient advocate. You know, you, I say from day one, um, you start working on uh, becoming uh, a physical therapist of sorts, at least enough for to uh, manage your own recovery. And of course, last week we talked a little bit about uh, that I see that the, that the people who tend to get better are the ones who tend to take responsibility for their own recovery and, uh, and do something about it. So how do you get moving? Well, there are a number of ways. Um, you can do it on your own. And, you know, I don't know, some people sitting in a wheelchair, that might not sound too possible, but I've got a number of wheelchair exercises and that I'm going to sh at least um, show you. Um, a lot of them come from my YouTube channel, and I realize, Samantha, I should probably make up a, a playlist to go along with this um, presentation. Then when you and I post it, we can post that playlist along with it and people can find the specific videos without that I'm talking about without um, uh, having to search through the channel. Perfect. So, you can do it on your own. A lot of people don't seem to think they can do it on their own. I think a lot of people are timid. I don't know if stroke makes you more timid or questioning or whatever, but I find that a lot of people don't seem to know how to get going. And to me, the answer was just get going, do something. Um, so you can do it on your own. If you're lucky enough to have someone, they can help you. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have someone who's bigger than you, they can really help you uh, in terms of like walking you with a gate belt and something, something like that. That's, you know, it's probably pretty hard to talk a 100-pound woman into walking her 200-pound husband who had a stroke with a gate belt. You know, well, it's probably pretty easy to talk a 200-pound husband into walking a 100-pound wife who had a had a uh, stroke, and I should say 130-pound, because there are very few 100-pound women. Some of them aren't healthy. Anyway, you can uh, maybe get somebody's help. Uh, I wish there were a lot more of me because I end up helping a lot of people in person. Um, that's not likely to happen. There aren't a lot of people out there that are trying to help stroke survivors and figure out how to be a physical therapist and not only take it from their recovery, but to other people. Uh, another way is a um, personal trainer. Now, typically insurance won't pay for a personal trainer, 
So another way to get a personal trainer, if you can't afford one, and typically I see people use personal trainers like after their insurance runs out. I think these are people that really like a lot of interaction. I can understand that because when I'm working with somebody, I enjoy that interaction. Will I let it stop me or slow me down if that opportunity went away, if I could no longer afford it or the person I liked left or something? Nah, I just go on on my own. One other way to get to the uh, personal trainer is, uh, like my gym is run by the hospital system. It's really good because it has a therapy pool, which we're going to get to in just a minute. One reason I pay the higher rate to be a member there. But they also have physiologists, not to be confused with um, f uh, physiatrists. And in Europe, they call uh, physiotherapists. So we got three kinds of physios there. And a, phys a physiologist is somebody that's they're basically like kind of like a sports and it's a little bit of small medical bent to a personal trainer. And at, at my gym, for example, you can pay $89 a month and go three days a week for an hour. That's a pretty good deal to get somebody to work with you three, that's 12 times. So it's about $7 an hour. I don't know how they do it because they got to pay them more than that. Anyway, um, and the other way, the most common way, uh, especially in the beginning, is with physical therapy. Uh, we're going to talk about physical therapy in a second. Um, another way you can get moving is if you're lucky enough to have a therapy pool. Unfortunately, we're um, heading out of the summer season when you can use municipal pools and things as a pool. It doesn't have to be a heated therapy pool. You can walk, go to a certain depth and walk crosswise at a community pool as long as you aren't so many kids that you're afraid somebody's going to swim into you. Uh, I've known a number of people do that. I've taken stroke survivors to um, condo association pools and neighborhood association pools, but you can only do it in the summer. Um, talking a lot about pools because I think it's probably the best type of physical therapy that you can get. Um, however, it's only available to a, a, a limited number of people. So let's take a look at the different kinds of uh, physical therapy that there are. Go ahead and advance it. Um, about one third of the people who have a stroke are lucky enough to go to a rehab hospital. I was, and I was shocked to find out that two out of three people don't get what I got. That means they send them home after three or four days from uh, neurology at the hospital, either uh, hopefully not intensive care, because hopefully they would keep you long enough to get you out of there. Uh, but basically, right from the hospital home, that's got to be rough. That's really got to be rough on um, your family caregivers who have now been thrust into this role that they didn't sign up for. But that's a whole nother, we could do an hour on caregiving. Um, some people have such a bad stroke that they're not going to be able to be transported very easily. I ran into one person like this in the 13 that I've worked with. And... Um, so they bring uh, people to the home. I find that the in-home physical therapy is average at best. I don't want to despair them because I actually have experienced with a couple of um, in-home therapists that were really pretty good. And um, so, but I don't, I'm not, uh, it's, it, well, hey, let's put it this way. Moving is better than no moving. So, <laughs> you know, whatever you, you can get. And then there's outpatient, which is uh, the most common. So uh, you've been released. You can get to outpatient. They don't need to send somebody to you. Uh, so you need to pick an outpatient facility. So you got basically two questions at this point. You know, sometimes this isn't really a question for some people, you know, like I lived in a small town and um, so there was one outpatient physical therapy place within 40 miles. So I didn't particularly like the physical therapist I had there. No, 
there wasn't a second one. I couldn't ask for a second one. That's something you can do in a larger facility if they have multiple therapists and you, you're not getting along with yours. Uh, you just ask for somebody else. But nope, couldn't do that. So the other option was drive 50 miles. And I already had somebody, a friend. I couldn't, I, the only way I could get there was a friend of mine coordinated her shopping um, two days a week and took me. Um, because uh, my wife was teaching in the middle of exams and, and such, and it uh, conflicted with her schedule. But if you get the option, if you live in a city or reasonable-sized metropolitan area, there are probably a number of facilities that you could look at. So, you know, there's some questions that might you might want to ask based on your situation. That's why it's important to know like what kind of stroke you had. I can tell you a couple of things about facilities and physical therapists. Um, and I'm getting ready to, in fact. And so there, uh, in a facility, you know, this seems like an obvious question, but I spend my whole day answering obvious questions. So, you know, one thing that you want to make sure of is assuming you have insurance, do they accept your insurance? Uh, I'm going to take a side little slight detour here because this is the point where I wanted to make, uh, let people know that many hospital systems, I don't know about Halifax, but I suspect they might, um, set up, um, my local hospital system has two ways you can end up in physical therapy for free. Number one, the offices themselves will um, you fill out a form and they petition the hospital and they'll let you in. Also, our, the regional hospital system that in my area has a community foundation and they can get you into physical therapy. They also do things like hook, sign you up with uh, reasonable mail drug costs through the mail and stuff. So if you have no insurance, try not to let that stop you. You can always do this at home. And I believe that most people who get better get better at home and they do it by doing more than 45 minutes a week at the, at PT. But physical therapists are valuable. They're, they're like a teacher. They know more than you do. And so, and <clears throat> a lot of people like to um, have somebody hold their hand. I'm not particularly one of them, but I found a lot of value in all the physical therapists I ever went to. So make sure they take, nope, go back for a sec. Um, a couple other things you want to do is what kind of field do you get for them? You know, if you have certain goals and uh, and ideas in mind, what do they say on their website page or on the wall if you make a personal visit? Um, does what they're trying to do line up with what you think you ought to be getting? Uh, I also have looked to see if they're, um, maybe it should say responsive first. Responsive and organized are kind of the same. But a good outfit will be well organized, friendly, and responsive. And those things typically show up in the beginning. If they don't show up in the beginning, they're not going to show up at the end. That's my takeaway from this. You know, people are typically consistent. If they don't show you the stuff from the get go, you're not likely to, to find it happening later. Another reason to pick a facility might be that they have specialty therapists. Say you need speech therapy and one facility has a speech therapist and another one doesn't and they both have physical therapists i ran into the situation recently because the person needed occupational speech and physical therapy and she wanted a pool well we couldn't find all fours but so we went with three out of four so because it's a lot more convenient um she has to be transported there in a wheelchair so it's a lot more convenient and the facility ended up setting up like her therapies like back to back for which is tough to do in the beginning because you don't have enough brain but it makes it a lot easier on getting there and, and getting back so if you need a specialty therapist and you have multiple therapies that might be a reason to choose one place over another uh, another reason is if you heard about a therapist or that really did good for somebody else or got recommended by the doctor that released you or your neurologist or something or in the case here's another case i have somebody i coach in uh, sacramento area 
and I decided she, based on lots of things we won't get into, she needed some kind of neuro uh, physical therapist. And so I looked up and found an NDT trained therapist who was near her and she picked the facility based on the fact that he was the only and only neuro trained. There were some on the other side of Sacramento. He was the only neuro trained therapist within a reasonable distance from her. And her husband didn't want to drive her more than 20 minutes. I family, I mentioned it last time, family never ceases to amaze me in a negative way. Sometimes I do amazing good things, so I shouldn't just say that. So, uh, you know, uh, another reason would be, I, I believe that people who are stroked, well, we'll get to that with a therapist. You know, another reason might be if you absolutely feel you've got to have that some kind of piece of equipment. I don't know what quite drives these folks, but there are a lot of people out there who think that, I, I think they haven't, this is opinion, I think they haven't quite accepted that they're the only answer to their problem, and they're still looking outside themselves. Some of them are take action and they're maybe split to where they're, you know, uh, uh, so there might be something that you want um, in, in a facility. Uh, on the left is actually a real picture of a friend of mine, not the one on the right isn't, but we'll get to that. And uh, she loves this um, bike. It's a combination of a, a recumbent uh, bike and um, e-stem, kind of like a Bioness or one of those other products, which are basically kind of fancy e-stem that work with a specific part of your body. So this system triggers um, electrical pulse up at your knee and down at your ankle, and it keeps track of the cycling, and it knows when to do that. And uh, she loves it and swears by it. And so there might be something like that that you're on to. The picture on the right is like, I don't know, it's kind of funny to me as a photographer because let's see how many people are in there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I guarantee you there are more than seven people standing behind the camera all telling each other what the picture should look like. It's so obviously perfect and staged, but it's a you know a heck of a facility. Look, they got walking tracks. They've got hurdles. They've got all kinds of stuff. Somebody's over there on a, is that a vibrator plate? It's not a BOSU ball. There's a BOSU ball, but nobody's on it. Anyway, um, some people think that uh, having equipment is uh, a good thing. And it is. I'm not here to disparage equipment. I got better without it. Uh, and I didn't, so that has influenced me. So um, there is some good in some of these, you know, high-tech walking devices. The one on the left is like kind of on the way out. Uh, he could just like walk off the frame on the left because the ones on the right are kind of replacing. And that's one with um, uh, a harness, so you, well, also a harness so you can't fall, but, a, but an automatic treadmill and it's got some kind of robotic legs there that are either moving yours or maybe triggering yours or or both. There are half a dozen types of these. There's also a, a uh, something that's really cool but really hard to get to it is relatively new is there are um, like treadmills or pools and they can like use the water to float you. And there's another one that um, actually I think they lift you out and so these are uh, in addition to the water I've always found the water I've taken people that can't walk on the land okay let's say Rob on the, uh, on the left here he's what uh, you in the medical profession and the nurses on the floor would say he's a Hoyer lift that means uh, he doesn't stand up he doesn't transfer he doesn't anything he's got a Hoyer lift and you know you got to crank him up out of the uh, easy chair to go to the bathroom or go to bed or anything. He can walk in the pool. Is it easy for him? Hell no. But I, I, I can't, I, I don't know. I've not worked with anybody worse than, than, than him. Uh, and we managed to get him in the pool. So, and the water seemed to be buoyant enough, but there are other systems that make you so you don't even weigh as much as you would, as little as you do, make you weigh less than you would even in the water. Um, therapy pools are great because, like I said, people can um, 
walk in the water where they can't because of, they don't weigh as much. And so you can practice things in the water. Um, recovery is practice, practice, practice. So the more time you spend practicing, the better you because you're patterning your brain. So you, you can be successful in a pool in a way that you can't be on land. And I always thought about it as walking, but then I had uh, Kevin there in the middle who wanted to um, do use the pool to move his hand arm. And darn if he didn't. I didn't know what I was doing. We just tried some underwater uh, standard land exercises underwater, and he could start to get the range of motion. Every time I've taken anybody to the pool, I've seen it translate to the land. So, unfortunately, it's probably only available to 10 or 20 percent of the people out there. And this is uh, one reason I belong to the gym I, ha I do. That they have a, a lift, too. We usually try and, if they can, Rob has to get lifted in and out. Kevin would have him walk in. But we would work them so hard, we don't want them walk, walking out. Uh, a good workout in the pool leaves you pretty much brain dead, and uh, it's better for your safety to just stick you in the chair and lift you out rather than make you negotiate the steps, which have handrails that are all set up for people with um, mobility issues. Now, here, now you go ahead. I wanted to show you a little bit more about specialty equipment and of course now you're putting up with me with Ralph because um, it's not that I don't believe in the robotic uh, treadmill it's like how do you get on one it's not something that you know is is easy to do and in some cases some of these things if they're not FDA approved or something you have to get your insurance company to pay for it Medicare won't pay for it. I'm not a Medicare expert. It's my understanding that if something's not FDA approved, you won't get Medicare to pay for it. So you can dream on about devices, but there's a device on the left that I consider the absolute best walker in the world. I have, uh, I decided I didn't want to sit in the car while other people were shopping. So I went in and I just got a walker and I walked around. And then I decided I didn't know where to go. So it's a it happened at a Home Depot one time with my brother-in-law. I said, where are you going next? He said, over to Hardware, aisle 19. I said, okay, I'll meet you over there. I'd get over there about the time he was ready to go someplace else. And I just bopped around the store. Since then, I've tried to hit my shins on them, and you cannot. As long as you have your arms out, you cannot hit your shins on a, on a, on a cart. I've tried very hard. And uh, they're readily available, and uh, we all like to eat, and... Uh, so I highly recommend shopping carts. Um, and the little thing on the right there, you can see the guy's Hemi Walker. He had that built for $150 on his deck because he didn't let um, therapy or anything get in his way. I see a lot of people when they come up against a problem, I see problems as a way to knock down the wall or a way to go around the wall or whatever the impediment is in front of me. It's an opportunity to create a solution. A lot of people see things as a brick wall. This is obviously a guy who didn't. And he, he told me, it was two years ago, he sent me that picture. I don't know where he is now. But he told me that he got pretty much better on his own with a $150 device that he had some uh, welder build for him. Pretty simple. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> These are all, nope, back. These are all three. Um, things that I did um, when I was working with people. On the left, um, I took was taking a stroke survivor. She was cerebral stroke, so she had ataxia, which means you can jump around and flail a bit. They had her at parallel at the parallel bars, and um, she was stepping on, uh, doing a foot placement with a maple block, uh, about a $100 maple therapy block. And uh, so I like to do stuff with the survivors I work, worked with. I went to their homes. In Kelly's case, I went three days a week and took her to pool therapy. And we'd do an hour or three days a week, and they wanted, we were working on toe, they were working on toe placement. I thought I should be working on toe placement. I don't want to buy $3,000 out of stainless steel parallel bars, you know, to work with Kelly for a few months on this. So... I came up with the idea of using a walker, 
Well, she jerked the walker up with her ataxia, so I put 50 pounds of sandbags on it. Never came off the floor again. So that's my version of parallel bars. Since she had ataxia and we're working on foot placement, she kicked the block. I got a like a 4x4 four four scrap. I found it on the side of my garage and took it over there. It didn't need a $110 therapy block. Maple. And... Um, but she kicked it and I felt bad for her. So I, one day I tried tape on the floor. And this is from a shot from a video I did. And I showed the, um, I showed the, the four by four block. And then I said, told the story and showed how, how the tape worked. So, you know, again, you, you just don't see things um, as obstacles. You see them as opportunities to solve problems. That's a little more easier at where I'm at now than when you're in a wheelchair. I recognize that. In the middle, we got, I got, a, had a guy I couldn't spend enough time with him. To, uh, if we're trying to get over fear, he's trying to learn to walk without a, a walker or cane at all. And I'd walk him light touch with a gate belt. I said to him one day, you know, I've seen you do it, boo, in the backyard. And I've seen you do it. It's 90% fear. He turned and looked at me and said, try 100%. So anyhow, you, in order to get over fear, the best way I found is to put people in a no fear zone for a long time. So I took, I actually bought the roll later. I don't need one, and uh, put the fifty pounds of sandbags on it. Guess what? You can't turn that sucker over. So I took it down there, and he was able to walk on his own in a safe way and be in that safe zone with no um, no walker and no cane. And you know, I showed him how to light touch the thing and then eventually we're we're still working on uh, getting him completely free but uh and then on the right this picture makes me really really happy because i this kid this kid he's 30 i'm 71 so he's a kid to me this young man had terrible stroke he's got a part of his head missing that's why he's got on the helmet so they hadn't put his uh his uh I don't know if they're going to put a plastic cap or whether, I don't remember whether they stored his skull in his stomach or chirogenically or whatever, but he's hasn't got his, uh, um, actually he had one and it got infected. They had to take it out again. He's still in that state. And they were going to send him home. There's no way they could get him to physical therapy. So I said, well, how's he going to stand up? And his therapist said, I don't know. She had let me come and work with him. I was shocked that the hospital let me do this. They put me on a list of family, and I went and worked with him the last four or five of his PT session with his physical therapist. And so I said, well, how's he going to stand up? Well, he's not going to be able to. Well, I managed to go to Home Depot and uh, design that and build it in about a week, and we got it there on a Friday. He got released on a Tuesday. And the big struggle was, will the physical therapist, the in-home physical therapist, accept it? And uh, he did. He finally looked at it a couple of weeks later and said, this thing's pretty stout. I said, yeah, hopefully you'll try it. Well, I wanted something that he could do without his physical therapist. And uh, a couple of weeks, months later, I got this picture from his mother. And the reason it makes me happy is that's his wife on the right and his father on the left. And they're standing him up without the physical therapist. So mission accomplished. And he's got a smile on his face. Um, this this young man has virtually nothing to smile about, but standing up um, is a is a big thing to to smile about. So uh, these are innovations that uh, I've made um, with resources. And meanwhile, back in Africa, we have. On the left, a guy I've been coaching for about a year and a half who lives in Malawi. And he saw my uh, video. He had a standing frame, he, which is what we call a walker. And he strapped it to the wall. And he was standing up that way. He has bars on a window. And he was using that. But he saw my um, parallel bars video. And darn if he didn't have a friend or his caregiver or somebody. Um, built him a set of parallel bars in his front yard. The young man in the middle was an athlete till he had a brain stem stroke. We saw a video of him in uh, one of the Facebook groups walking with a broken blue plastic uh, lawn chair um, as a cane. He doesn't have a cane. 
He doesn't have anything. That's the best thing he could come up with to walk. I decided that, uh, well, um, a couple, several of us, I shouldn't take all the credit for it. Several of us decided that um, this man had uh, wanted to get better and that he should have the tools to do that. So we raised uh, money and uh, he sent me a picture of his new walker this morning. And um, we actually raised enough money to help four people. I'm working with the physical therapists of the guy on the left in Malawi to make sure that what um, he was telling me is what his therapist wants and the best way to get it. We're going to try and get him a knee brace to help to help him. I was shocked that we raised uh, six times the amount of money to get this uh, young man a walker in about uh, one day. Uh, and the guy, uh, the one on the right was just um, uh, the guy on the left doing, uh, they're just, you know, they got a dirt floor, they use a dirt floor. Um, so don't let um, anything stop you would be the, the moral here. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so side trip to devices and what do you want to look for in a therapist? Uh, well, the first thing is, do they seem interested in you? Are they going to take a personal interest in you and your case? Are they asking a lot of questions about what type of stroke you have, or do they have paperwork on it and they're telling you things like you had such and such a stroke, so we're going to focus on this? Do they ask you what your goals are? Because you should have goals, and they should have goals for you. This is a team effort that you're trying to make. So it's important that they be interested in you. It's also important that you like them. I, I find that I don't like, uh, if I don't like somebody, I don't really want to do anything for them. That works against recovery. I know I'm kind of an obstinate person. Not everybody's like me, but uh, I think it helps anybody and everybody uh, um, if they uh, have a good relationship. We talked a little bit about that last week, basically the, the, the sh short version of that would be um, ask them for homework, do the homework, come back and impress them, you'll have a completely different relationship. Okay, so another thing I, I oh, back, I'd look for would be, um, do they have any neuro trained? Now I mentioned the word letters NDT, that uh, was the only type I was aware of two years ago when I was looking in Sacramento. There are other types of neurotrained physical therapists. NDT is a specific certification from an organization, and there are, I think, only about 3,000 of them in the U.S., 2,000. Um, but there may be another 2,000 um, neurotrained, uh, another type of neurotrained, um, and there are also therapists, I've asked this question, I recently found uh, the, the woman that wanted, needed speech, uh, uh, occupational and um, physical therapy, I asked who on the staff was neurotrained. Well, they had one person. Another place that we were interviewed was they had stroke, somebody who specialized in stroke and had done some of their training and uh, initial work when they were getting educated in with stroke patients. So that's acceptable. Why does this make a difference? Um, that's because there's nothing wrong with a sports uh, therapist and they have their place. You know, if you uh, break a, a bone or uh, injure yourself in a sports injury or something, they know all about that. They don't, they tend to start with the body and the injury because that's what they're trying to fix. And I don't think they make as good a therapist as um, somebody who's worked with stroke survivors because they start with the brain instead of the body. And they understand how the brain works. They understand what your deficits are. And hopefully they try and line up a plan based on your deficits and their knowledge that would benefit you. Um, if you're in a small town, like I said, I had to drive 40 miles to the next place if I, cause, and I didn't like my physical therapist. So they certainly didn't have any neuro train. Part of this, so part of this presentation has, is more relevant to people in, um, 
um, small areas. Small areas. Oops. Mistake. Are they well organized and friendly? We already had that. That was uh, left, left over um, left over from the other slide. That's why it's in italics because I was supposed to get rid of it. Oh, well, that's what happens when you do this till midnight. Um, the other thing is back to specialty therapists. I mentioned this on the previous slide. You might need uh, if you need them then you should look for a place and look for a therapist that specializes in them. There are two types of occupational therapists in my experience. I don't think they make any designation between them um, in terms of the letters they have after their name. But typically, um, you want to find, if you want to get your hand back, you want to find somebody that's going to work with you in terms of getting movement back in your hand. You don't want to find somebody that's going to teach you how to button your shirt one-handed unless that's what you want to do. And um, sometimes they'll switch on you. They, uh, all therapists have to decide because of insurance companies whether or not you're making pro enough progress for the insurance company. So one of the things that I, I've seen occupational therapists do, they did it to somebody I was taking and she didn't like it one bit. but. They uh, switch her over from trying to make her hand function to trying to teach her how to adapt and function in life. Speech therapy is, in, is interesting because a good speech therapist will make a lot of di a, a lot of difference. And there's another boy. I need to fix this. There's another italicized thing. Why didn't I just kill them when I knew they weren't didn't belong here? All right. So quick so, question, uh, Ralph. There sure. was a question in regards to the the uh, type of stroke. Um, does the type of stroke have an uh, outcome difference as far as, and I think this is what the question is asking, the rehab I think, component? Yeah, I but, think it's in the next slide, actually. Let's okay. see. I, uh, yeah, there it is. Second, po second point. So uh, this is just a reminder, you know, just like you want to learn all you can about stroke in the brain, you want to learn all you can about physical therapy because you are going to be without a physical therapist at, at some point, and either you're going to have some knowledge to continue or your recovery could come to a bit of a, a problem. And yes, that's a very good question, obviously. Um, different types of strokes have different effects. Uh, I mentioned Kelly and the, she had a cerebral stroke and ataxia. Uh, strokes of the brain stem, or not the brain stem specifically, boy, it's so specific back there where it hits. Strokes of the cerebellum cause um, coordination issues. Strokes to the, uh, in the back of the brain, so the frontal lobes, tend to have, uh, I think, more problems, and they can have uh, coordination problems, and, well, you're actually, your vision centers are back there. I didn't know this until recently. Um, strokes back there are, are, aren't great and so you know Kelly uh, would be you know good to know that I mean of course she did know she had ataxia um, and uh, if you talk to a neurologist it can't be fixed if you talk to me I can tell you that we got rid of a lot of it by strengthening her core and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate the importance of core here in, in just a minute but Finding out what type of stroke you had could affect how you interact with your physical therapist, the knowledge that you want to gain. Uh, when he knows Joe McCullough, he had a cerebral stroke, and one of the effects that he had was he was nauseous all the time. He threw up all the time. No matter what he did, ginger ale, anything, whatever, nobody could tell him the answer. He finally Googled it, and... Um, they hate Dr. Google, by the way, at all hospitals and all physical therapy, but um, they're stuck with him. Anyhow, and he found out that this was a function of a cerebral stroke. So uh, we've been spreading the word about that um, ever since. You know, typically that's what I do when I find out something. I find somebody else. I don't go looking for them, but they come across my path. Somebody else who has a similar issue, and I go, oh, I know about that, and I help them out. Anyway, so what type of stroke you had makes a, a big difference. People who have a right side stroke, I shouldn't say that because there are some language centers in the brain and 
We have Dr. Hetzler coming back next week to talk about that, and I don't know enough about it. Typically, people who have language issues have a left stroke because the majority of the language center are um, over on the left. And I have heard Dr. Hetzler say the right side of the brain is mute, but there are some couple of things over there that work in coordination. So you'll kind of know it, though, if you can't talk. I mean, I can't believe I said that, but uh, it's more subtle with other things. If that person had a particular type of stroke and want to know, actually, uh, back to Dr. Hetzler, he did a thing on anatomy of a stroke. Uh, two weeks ago on our Tuesday show, and I thought um, I knew about most types of stroke. I could have named probably 15. He probably went over 20 or 25. And so I had somebody go through that presentation and pull out all the different types of strokes that you can have to the different areas and what the consequences of those might be in terms of deficits. And uh, we actually, I got a notice this morning that we finally got that. So It'll be, a, um, it'll be a PDF that I can send to you, Samantha, and you can distribute to um, anybody that you know, might need it. It's going to be like a lookup chart. It's like an hour's worth of his presentation in the lookup chart. Um, so go ahead and do the next slide because I need to get done in an hour. <laughs> okay, this is uh, back to, you know, reiterating uh, becoming your own physical therapist goes for occupational therapy as well. How do you do this? Well, you save those sheets. You know, in the beginning, you know, you don't put much value in them. But after you've been released or graduated or whatever they call kicking you out, you'll wish you had them. It's kind of like your hospital records. Even if you don't see the value now, just go ahead and file them away in a folder. You might be referring back to them. I would also suggest... Um, that you search YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. Mine's not the only one. Uh, Dr. Tara Tobias, who's a neuro-trained physical therapist, by the way, probably has one of the best ones. Um, maybe better than mine. Different perspective, though. I approach everything from the survivor point of view, and there are some things I know as a survivor that she can't know because she haven't, hasn't had a stroke, but she's excellent. There are a number of things on YouTube. You can also look at other uh, sources online or in books. Internet needs a T and I need a comma between them. No one's, no one's judging that, Ralph. Yeah, I am. I, I have a question, another question. Uh, what kind of yeah. therapy can you do for vision deficits? Do you Have mm. you ever worked with someone with vision deficits? Yes, Kelly had serious vision deficits. Um, God, I mean, I just can't know everything about everything. I do know something about this. I do know that a well-respected hospital system in our area who I work with, and I will not name because it's the only thing I've ever seen close to a black mark for them, to an expert. Um, well, what you want to do is go to a neuro-ophthalmologist. And there are such things as neuro-ophthalmologists, people who deal with the um, vision issues caused by brain issues, basically. There's, it's like everything else. You can't move your arm because you have a brain injury. There's nothing wrong with your arm. And typically, now that's not true always with eyes because people end up with vision loss and blind spots and things. But they're also neurological stuff. And I'm getting like out of my comfort zone in terms of my knowledge here. One thing I can tell you is that under a physical therapist with Kelly, we did the old um, in, out, left, right, diagonal thing. I have it on my YouTube channel called Eye Exercises. It's also part of another video on my YouTube channel called Coordination Drills. When I make up that playlist, I'll try and remember to put them in too. What it is is there, um, basically you move a finger. I have somebody now who doesn't have anybody, uh, somebody I, I coach in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, who's doing it herself, and she says she has ataxia and had a cerebral stroke, has um, dysarthria, which is problems with speaking, and she also has the uh, um, slight double vision and all the problems that go with stroke eyes and uh, cerebral stroke. And I can tell you that I did those with Kelly for almost five years, and she made me do them. She was a big believer in them, 
because they told her at the eye institute that she had jittery eyes when I met her. When I met her, she couldn't sit up. She couldn't uh, get on all fours. She couldn't even roll. We had to teach her how to roll. Uh, she, could do, she couldn't feed herself, couldn't do anything. And her eyes jittered. And these eye exercises got rid of the, or something got rid of the jitter. Yeah. She, she swore by them. And uh, uh, I was taught them by a physical therapist and they do stimulate the um, their five cranial nerves associated with the eyes. Five or four? There are a number of them, and they stimulate all of them. And um, she made me do them before I left, in addition to when I, I got there. She believed in them so much. Did she still wear her double vision glasses? Yeah. Did her eyes cheer? No. So, you know, improvement's improvement, um, the way I look at it. Um, so I can... Um, Make sure that I, if you remind me, I'll make sure and you can pass those videos, uh, the video on to some, to the person. Yep, sure. That's, uh, that's a tougher, that's a tougher one. I didn't deal with that other than through other people. So I know a lot more about hemiplegia because that's what I've recovered from. So I think you should also, while you have a physical therapist, uh, while not, uh, that, you know, tr try everything that you, you have to establish good relationship because if you don't have a good relationship and you ask them a lot of questions, they're going to consider you annoying them. That's what another reason, uh, a good relationship is important and you demonstrate to them that you want to get better. If you do this in the right way, they'll see it as part of you wanting to get better as opposed to them annoying you. It's a good idea if you have any questions about any uh, outside sources that you might get a second opinion on them while you have a physical therapist because you won't forever. Okay. So what do I think is the most important out of these three? Is it devices, therapist attitude, therapist devices attitude, therapist attitude devices? It, I would have to say, next slide. Attitude, because without the uh, proper attitude, you aren't going to go to the physical therapist. You're not going to do your homework. Um, I also, I'm not trying to run down devices, but I think somebody that uh, the therapist becomes more key because a lot of these devices that people seek out, they require a trained therapist to implement them. I mean, the average person doesn't have access to a robotic uh, treadmill and they certainly can't afford one. Uh, they're forty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars. You're not going to buy one for your recovery like you buy a walker or a cane and a, some putty and some therabands. Um, so the therapist is is really key because if you um, uh, want to use a certain device or you believe in 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 devices, then you're going to need a therapist. So that's the order to me. This is opinion again. All right, go ahead and advance. So my advice is to get moving. We're gonna go through this kind of quickly. Um, go ahead and advance. In order to get moving, you have to go through this. This is kind of like the cycle of acceptance that we talked about last time about, you know, uh, accepting what's happened to you. A lot of people start out with, I can't. And then they move to, well, maybe I can. And then you have to move to, okay, I'm going to give it a try, and hopefully you're going to end up um, proving to yourself that you can. I'm a big believer in success building on success. So when you get to that last stage, you can kind of like wipe off the other three because you start believing in yourself, and that's really important in, in recovery. So next. Okay, so you can get moving even if you're in bed. This is our friend Steve. Uh, Steven in bed again, the guy that I built the um, parallel bars for, no way to transport him easily. So they started with bed exercises. I know a little bit about them. I guess I'm going to know more about them because I'm getting a lot of call from people. Everybody that when I make a video, everybody says, but I can't do that. Okay, well then do this. And well, I can't do that. So I keep going lower and lower. And I'm going to end up making this, uh, some videos on bed exercises. But there are some they're similar to the exercises you do when you use a massage table, things like bicycling and kicking and, and, and whatever. 
so you can get moving and and so that's the physical therapist and again the dad he gave him sheets i don't know if stephen did them but he gave him sheets on the exercises that he could be doing in bed so it's you know um being in bed is not an excuse to if you want to get moving uh next so there's some wheelchair exercises that we're going to show real quick. Uh, the first two are uh, me going, getting back in the uh, oh, back. Sorry, I thought it was a video we could play. <laughs> no, no, they're screen grabs from the video. Video doesn't work too well in bed. It's working better these days in PowerPoint. But um, basically, on the left, I'm doing toe raises, and uh, you can if you can't do them on your own, I'm showing you how you can use a band. In that video, I also show you how you can use a rope. You can use a gate belt. You can do anything to uh, assist. Sometimes when you can't do something, people go, well, I can't do that. Well, try and figure out an adaption. Try and figure out, you know, get another body part to do it. Reach down with, and pull your toe up with your, with your unaffected hand. What, if you don't have a TheraBand, there's always some way you can move. And so that video goes over some of those things. It also tells you not to tie it, anything to the wheelchair arm because that'll make your foot supinate to the outside and you don't want to play into ankle roll if you have it. And on the right, on the left, on the right is um, leg lifts. You clearly do them and also um, I'm showing myself doing them without the TheraBand, but you can do the same thing with the band or the, or, or the rope. So next slide. Um, anything and everything that you can do, that you do with your hand, you can do from a wheelchair. There's no requirement to stand up. I'm sitting in uh, the same chair I'm sitting in right now, a different table, um, shooting a video about hands. So there's no requirement there. Uh, flip. And on my channel, I've got actually 12 videos on uh, hand recovery. There are things that I did. Notice they all use things like penny, like um, change and bolts and uh, rubber bands and uh, nope rubber bands isn't in here but uh, I'm a big believer in not having to have uh, some device you don't have I don't let that stop you I made that piggy bank I've made three or four of them for shark survivors and take them a, do a couple bucks for the change and get them to pick it up and they're doing occupational therapy all these videos are on my YouTube channel go ahead and flip um, another thing nope another thing you can do is um, uh, shoulder work, start working on your shoulder and your arm. Uh, one of the simplest things you can do, let me see if I stand up a little bit, is you can take your affected arm and put your good arm under it, uh, above the elbow, and you start lifting it up. And look, I'm working that shoulder. I had one person who wouldn't do it above the elbow, and all they did was bend their elbow which isn't bad except their problem is in their shoulder not so much in their elbow but again you can always think of something here i'm doing um shoulder uh, shrugs straight up and down you can also do them affected side only and in the middle i'm doing rolls i usually roll forward five or ten and then i roll backward um same number and then on the right we've got the scapula pinch this is a really good one for getting control of those, um, I don't know the names of muscles back there. That hold, the piecemeal? Yeah, I guess so, that hold, that hold um, your shoulder in place because a lot of people um, lose those muscles and they end up with either a loose, uh, you end up with a pinched, frozen, subluxation. There are any number of issues and this is because, Samantha knows this, because unlike a ball and socket in your hip, your shoulder is just kind of like in a C it, it, in between the bones and the muscles hold it in place and when those muscles fail it pretty much it can move actually totally out of the socket i believe it's not a socket out of the space it's supposed the space, to be yeah so these are all things that you can do to um because that's going to be an issue for you i had three quarters inch sticking out on this scapula i got rid of a half of an inch if i pull my t-shirt real tight and i tell you what to look for you can still see it but you know I can also have full use of my uh, shoulder. Um, so this is something you want to try and do like from the get-go. Okay, next one is the 
Like you can also do this in a wheelchair. I'm sitting in the same chair again. Uh, on the left, we got short lever. It's like one, two, three, four, and then long lever, it's an eight count. And uh, I've shot these, I'm about to edit them. And then there's long lever where your arms are straight. And people out there watching this are going, but I can't put my arm out straight. I can't get it above my head. Well, do it the best you can, because if you start, if you, you know, get moving and try and stay moving, it'll keep going up higher and higher and higher. Uh, you know, like on the left, that might be as high as you can go. I, mean, I try and go all the way straight. I took a frame in the middle so I could talk about that. Um, one of the things I've noticed is most people have start having a problem when it gets even with their shoulder. Um, getting your arm above your shoulder is, once you start doing that, I found with not only with myself, but a couple other people, once you go like from here to here, it's a lot easier to go all the way up from here. It's this part like in here for whatever reason. And again, I'm not a PT or a doctor. I'm an observer. And so go ahead and ahead, Samantha. And um, what about on the floor? Of course, this brings up the question, you know, and I get this all the time. I have it right now because I posted, somebody posted some core exercises and I added a couple of screen grabs that you're about to see here. And of course, we got the question, how do you get on the floor? So I've got a video on how to do it out of a wheelchair because, you know, whenever you say, anything about the floor, people will tell you, well, I can get, well, this guy today said, I can get on the floor, it's getting back up, this is a problem. Anyway, if you can get on the floor, that's a good thing, uh, because there are a number of core exercises. This is a screen grab from um, video. Um, there are a couple of ways to get out of a chair. One is to go forward like this. It kind of requires people are saying, yeah, but your left hand is fully functional there. Yeah, well, I can do it. I can do it with that hand behind my back, too. Uh, uh, I mean, you can get to a certain, you have to get to a certain level of strength to be able to do certain things. That, that, that's true. There's also another method where you drop one knee uh, while you're sitting there instead of putting your hands forward. Um, we trained Kelly to do this uh, so that she could get out of her chair on her own safely and get back in it uh, so she could get on the mat and do core work because there's core again. Core is important. And guess what? Here's stroke walking better core. These are three simple exercises you can do. Like what I said with Kelly, we started with rolling because she couldn't get on all fours. Nope. So rolling was first and then crawling. And then bird dogs are real good. They're a, a balance uh, thing. You put uh, one leg. They also deal with opposition because you put out one arm and one leg, the opposite arm, the same way you walk. So go ahead, um, Samantha. It keeps, oh. it keeps double doing it. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so, you know, if you... Um, you know, these are, I'm sure, to spark controversy because, you know, a newbie isn't going to go doing planks and bridges. But there are a lot of good core work you can do if you can get down on the mat. And so I try and get people to be able to get down on the mat, do core work, even if they're not walking perfectly. Uh, there was the same question came up the other day. It comes up regularly. What would you tell somebody who's five months out and they said, what would you tell the, yourself at five months that you, you know now that you didn't know then? And my standard answer is the importance of core and walking in as a, it's a crane for your arm as well. Uh, core is involved in everything. If you don't think that, just try breaking your shoulder like I did one time. You can't get out of bed without your core. You can't do anything without your core. Anyway, uh, so these are bridges and planks. It opens up a whole world of opportunity, even if you can't do this high level of core work. I mean, with Kelly, we started with knee stands, and then we introduced the long and short lever while she's doing knee stands. Why? Because with her ataxia, she wasn't as she, well. She got a lot more precise. But even if you don't have ataxia, like sometimes one of my core exercises I do is sit on a big balance ball, and then I do weights. Why? Because the weights, when you move the weights, they're shifting around your weight and you're getting really subtle core 
cues. You're having to straighten out to not fall off that ball. You're getting core work and you don't even hardly know it. Anyway, next. Uh, another thing that's good to do, of course, and everybody wants to do this, is stand up. So how do you stand up? Go ahead to the next one. Uh, this is a system I worked out for a couple of people that are uh, I was working with that worked on this. I'm using a suction rubber, uh, a suction cup grab bar, and uh, that particular one, I did a video. I was just gonna rip it off the the counter there, and I thought I wouldn't really have any problem. I didn't think that would be a problem because I thought it would take enough effort that it was safe for what I was using it for. Well, I got a shock of my life, which was it took me 10 pulls in both hands and standing back and leaning and I basically ended up jerking it to the side where I broke the suction. I couldn't lift it off. So, uh, and I also put the wheelchair right behind him and I, I teach people, uh, like when I was working with Kelly and we're working on standing and then standing in neutral. I said, you know what happens if, you know, you have a problem? She said, no, what? I said, you sit back down. And I said, you, you know what happens if you are out of control? She said, no. I said, I'm going to grab the gate belt and I'm going to push you back in the chair. I said, you want to practice it once? I didn't think she'd say yes. She did. So we practiced a couple times. It actually got rid of her fear that there was a plan for how to do it. So the plan here is lock your darn wheels on your wheelchair because if you come... Uh, flying back into it, you want them locked. And there I'm, you know, faking my left arm doesn't work, so, and then you can stand up one-legged, so this is a way, you know, to try and get out of that chair. You can also, I'm sitting in this chair right now, I can also do stuff like, I can try and come up. That's working my legs, for sure. So, move, get moving. Okay, next. Uh, another thing you can do, this requires somebody else. This is Kevin again, and in the beginning I used a gate belt, and I would actually pull up maybe 30 pounds or so because he couldn't quite do it, even a decent shape, strong guy. Um, I, I try and wean him off of that pretty quick. On the right you'll see a thing I worked out with him that I've used since. Basically, I didn't want him pulling on my arm. I'm a stroke survivor myself. I didn't want him pulling me over for one. I also was trying to get him to do it with his legs. So we, I ended up grabbing his elbow and he can only grab mine. It calms the brain and gives him something to stabilize his balance, but you can't hardly pull on my arm that way. Uh, just doesn't work. Okay, but you have to have somebody who's willing to do this for you. And of course, the other thing you can do is try and do nose over toes. Um, I've got a video on this one, getting out of a chair. Um, you have to slide up. You have to get your nose over your toes or you're not going to be able to stand up. I show you how you can't get out of a chair if you're not slid up in, in this. So, uh, more get moving. So, we're going to have to flip through. So, if you can get moving and get out of the chair, you might be able to start um, walking. Um, I used a cane for a while. I didn't really like it, but they had suggested it, and it gave me, it didn't really help my walking. Most of these things, the real issue is your brain, and um, it calmed my brain down having it. Eventually, I said, nah, it's a nuisance, and uh, I ended up uh, giving it to Neil Isaac, actually, when I taught him how to use a cane to raise his arm above his shoulder. So, next. So this is, be, I'll try and be brief with this. There's too many pictures. They're all of me because I don't have a lot of pictures of other people. I don't have the rights to put them out there without their permission. But therapy's all around you. Once you get moving somewhat, uh, and this is, um, there's all kinds of things that, that you can do. Uh, so go ahead and flip through these kind of quick and then like washing your car. You want to talk about wax on, wax off, this is it. You know, you can do all kinds of circular things that I find are really good because they use a lot of um, uh, combinations of muscles and they're intense in terms of brain activity to figure out how to do something smooth in both directions. It takes a lot of brain. So washing the car. Uh, I did a lot of cooking. This is about a year out for me. 
I do. I like to cook, and I got involved. You know, sometimes I was like be slicing the zucchini, and I was like, uh, like I felt like sometimes I had to like time it so I could chop the zucchini when it was rolling by because my left hand would roll a bit. But I was always real careful. I never really have cut myself. I didn't do it intentionally. I've had a couple of times my left hand got out of control, and uh, when I was cooking, and uh, ended up like hitting the point of a knife, but no blood. Uh, one day I was at therapy and they had me do all these spindles off the top shelf. And I got home and I was taking the vitamins down. And I said, there's no difference. So I used to take the vitamins down five, ten times. There's seven or eight of them up there, as you can see. I'd take them all down and put them all back up like five times. Uh, this therapy. Another thing to do is like twist off caps. Don't twist the bottom, twist the cap. That's my affected left hand. I'm twist, there's a single frame from a sequence. Anyway, there's, you want to use that hand as much as you can. Okay, I still do about half of my vacuuming left-handed. About halfway through, I get tired of it and I switch because it's too slow. But uh, I vacuumed for a long time, totally left-handed. I found things like driving the car and the lawnmower rototiller things that had both hands and you had to steer those are real good for my hand and my shoulder one on the right is kind of a more recent picture ten no five years out maybe and uh, uh, you can get to where you can do a lot of stuff I got a lot of stuff going on right there I'm about to run what I call run out of brain because I'm on a ladder, I'm leaning out, I got my left hand involved, I'm trying to hold that board, I'm trying to put the, I'm screwing in a screw, so I got to get the drill bit in the hole, there's a lot going on. Challenging brain is a good thing, I checked with my neurologist, I said I'm pushing myself hard, how do I know how hard to push? He said keep pushing yourself, your brain will let you know if you're pushing too hard. So there you have it from a neurologist, have at it as hard as you can. Uh, Gardening is great. Next. Uh, so, quick review. I don't know if we got time for this. But just, okay, so. It's going, it's going on. Do it real quick. It's stay moving. So, you're going to have good and bad days. It's how you react to them. And you can't let a bad day, like, look at that Friday, May 31st. This is a stock market curve. That would have been a bad day in your recovery because you've been going down and you've seemed like you've reached a, a new low. Oh, look, because you can't remember where you started all those months ago. Um, so you gotta look at the big picture. Next. Uh, it's real important to pay attention to all improvements because success builds on success. If, you know, I, I remember where I am, but some people write them down. And set small achievable goals because that makes you be successful. We've covered 45 minutes, doesn't cover it. We've covered and established the best relationship you can. And we're back to the same old statement, only you can make you better. Next, so, okay, this one we'll spend just 30 seconds on. Um, one of the things that I've learned recently is that you plateau when you don't challenge the brain. So we've got actually a couple of uh, hour-long discussions on this that I've had recently that are on the YouTube channel. If you learn about this, you learn about m mixing things up and challenging the brain because the brain's lazy and it'll take the lazy way out. And if it takes the lazy way out, then you're going to stop improving and your curve is going to go like this. And after it starts getting flat for a few weeks, they're going to start talking about graduating or releasing you. So one thing you can say is talk to them about this early. You know, Tell them that you know something about this and you want to continue to challenge your brain. You know, again, this is another reason to have a good relationship with your physical therapist because you don't want them to think that you're telling them what to do, but you also want to be able to share some that you know have some knowledge and discuss it with them and then turn it put it back on them. So I, I'm just a stroke survivor. You're the expert. So what can you help me do? that will challenge my brain and keep me from plateauing because I want to be here as long as you um, and the insurance company will allow me. And I'm here to tell you that physical therapists have some latitude. I know because I've got good relationships with some of them. 
from my own therapy, from following my own advice, and also from bringing other survivors. They know what I do, and I know that they've cut me some slack. So there you go. The brain needs to be challenged. Mix it up. Uh, it's always about repetition, repetition, repetition. Mass practice is the concept of doing a lot, uh, doing a lot of uh, therapy in a block of time rather than doing four. If you do four hours a day, you're better off to spend four hours in a row rather than do nine to 10, 11 to 12, two to three, and four to five. It's uh, been proven by science. And we're back to core, core, core. And some answers. Oh, okay. And attitudes, everything. Uh, this was from last week, and this week, and next week, and the week after, um, or month. And more movement equals less depression. Another reason to get moving because you'll start being successful. And it's also proven that when you move, that your brain uh, gets more serotonin. It's you know that's where the runner's high comes from. So. Good thing because a lot of us deal with depression. I certainly did. Okay, we're about to at the end here, Samantha. Next. So, what you want to do is keep moving. And next up, we're going to talk about walking better. We're going to get into specifics about um, walking and things that you can do to deal with uh, ankle roll, drop foot, all those things. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to take this on in an hour or at all. Except I do know a bit about it from my own recovery. But it's, it's a big subject. And, of course, the very first thing I said was all strokes are different and they're all recoveries are different. So you got to learn how to take the information that comes to you and um, adapt it to your situation. Yeah, yeah, like I said, yet another thing you have to do, like being your own best patient and advocate. But so I, am, I invite everybody to take their... Um, mute button off if they have any questions for you directly, Ralph. Because I know that it sometimes takes everybody a little bit of time to do that. I find people who are timid and don't ask questions. I th I think uh, I think we have some good some good company. <laughs> Well, I'm not knocking you, you, your company. I just, um, you know, and I'm no expert. I've done 25 uh, uh, stroke buddies and 10 or 12 roadmaps. Well, actually, we don't have people in roadmap, but I, Winnie will tell you I can't get people to participate and ask questions. Oh, well, yeah, some we do, but sometimes a lot of people are hesitant. So uh, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, like last time we had questions were really discussions really between m me and Art and about the hospital system. Right, so, right. So I cut it out of mine. I don't know what you did. No, that's you. fine. Well, there's no point in making anybody listen to this right here. Yeah. <laughs> Art, do you have any questions for Ralph? Uh, why didn't he talk about eggplant instead of zucchini? That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> Well, because zucchinis being smaller and rounder, I found that they roll better or a lot more easily um, than, yeah, I mean, try and hold a, I mean, this is something I, I could only try and explain it um, when he's laughing because she knows. Try and hold a zucchini steady with your affected hand while you cut it with a, a knife. You don't want to put that <laughs> knife in the affected hand, I can tell you that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, if, if your affected hand is your dominant hand, it's a be a good idea to learn how to use a knife with your um, non-dominant, unaffected hand. Because mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of jerkiness for a while. I would, when I was driving, I'd drive one-handed because I wanted to train that arm not to, it would suddenly turn the wheel one way or another. No, I practiced this way out in the country and every time a cement truck came at me, I put both hands on the wheel uh, because I don't want to get hit by a cement truck or any truck. No, that'd be terrible. Particularly not a cement truck. Uh, it happened one time. That's why I have the visual on it. I was Good like, Lord. I went, oh, I came up over a hill and there, there was a cement truck. And I just quickly went, bump, back to both hands. <laughs> I'm a big believer in safety. In all my videos, you'll see me touch things or talk to you about how you transition from one thing to living without it. 
um, because falls and accidents and things set you back. They set you, they can set you back physically. I don't know, for whatever reason, it's like a magnet. We all tend to fall on our affected sides. Possibly could have to do with weakness. What do you think there, Smith? Yeah, but I concur. The other thing is it you can heal from that. Um, when you take a fall, it, it deals, uh, well, I mean, you could hurt yourself really badly in a fall, but the emotional a fall is going to hurt your, hurt, set you back more mentally than it will physically. Right. Increases because depression. You, you, you lose that confidence. You become timid. And increases your depression. Right, Art? Like you just right. think you can't do then. Yeah. And that's part of that, that, so trend, that, that trend, right? You got to, you have a bad day, work past it. Right. You know, I always success. tell people if you're having a exactly. bad day, if things aren't going well for you in physical therapy, if you're doing it most every day, don't worry about it. Six days a week is just as good as seven. You know, it doesn't do any good to beat yourself up. And um, yeah, so just uh, especially if you're working on form, when your form goes all, all to, heck, to heck, that's when it's time to stop. Because you can end up reinforcing bad habits that you then have to unlearn later. That's a subject for an hour because in order to walk, you have to accept certain things that you can't do. And yet you want to overcome those as quickly as possible so that you can uh, unlearn them. Right, Winnie? <laughs> she's working on on uh, on that interim stage and learning some of those things that she had to do early on uh, but that you know your therapist will say well your hip is still dipping and you're you know you're not lifting that leg enough and your heel toe pronation is okay but not great you know so you know there's a lot of things if you can move on from um you have to, you don't want to reinforce bad habits and we get forced to do things, interim things that we have to then unlearn to do better. So it's best not to um, do anything to make that whole situation worse. So that's why zucchini art, was that, uh, I, um, I went into about everything else in the world, including the zucchini, but i um, pretty good at that. You muted yourself, Art. <laughs> Is that you better? Had, yes, you had background noise, I guess, that you muted for. Yeah, we love to go to farmer's markets. So, uh, you know, we pick up all these different things that, you know, you need to have specialized movements for. What, like eggplant? Well, I love eggplant, especially Parmesan, you know, but that's beside the point. I'm talking about... <laughs> The types of peppers and things like that that uh, you have to roll when you're cutting and and and, that, and not slice your fingers off and all that. Well, I mean, they make adaptive cutting boards and stuff. I don't know a lot about that because um, there are plenty of people who do in the groups, and I figure I'll let them. You know, they'll all chime in and say, "Well, I got this cutting board or I got that cutting board." My philosophy is, um, and it's not possible for everybody, so I know this isn't real world, but my whole attitude and my recovery and everything would be, remember I said when they start teaching you how to button your shirt one hand, it's time for a new OT. My, what I tried to do was get back um, what I could so that I didn't need to adapt. Now, I know that's not possible for everybody, but that's the goal. So I, I don't... I didn't want an adaptive cutting board. I, I knew that if I cut zucchini every night, not every night, but if I, you know, uh, I cut onions every night. Um, if you, if you, if you use it, that's the whole point of therapies all around you would be to use it. They, they teach uh, what they call involvement uh, at the rehab hospitals. I named it integration because I want another I word and to kind of play off involvement and integration. It was the concept of like integrating it into your entire life. I do a lot of yard work and I painted my house. And I mean, there's, I wash the dishes. Everything is, uh, I have a dishwasher, I hate it. I'd rather wash the dishes and it's good therapy. Every, you know, every, any, my once said, and this is, uh, I don't know, but I'll say it again. 
There's no better therapy to prepare you for life than life itself. Right, kind of on. true. So, you know, we, uh, we collectively as a, a group, I have, and, and um, we have a, a number of like-minded individuals that are you know, preaching the same sort of thing, um, which is um, use it all the time. I actually, you know, people ask the question all the time in the groups, like, um, I'm three years out. Will I ever get my hand back? Well, I know a woman in Charleston that got her hand back at five years. And you know what? She got decided to get over her stinky attitude and she got it back by doing housework. Mm 